And obviously we're here to talk about mainly the S3B Viking, a fascinating yeah. aircraft. Uh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Laurie, yeah, like how did your transition from that support squadron go on to the Viking? And yeah, what, what were your first thoughts of that aircraft? It's a beautiful aircraft. It is, you know, the S3V gets, uh, it, in naval aviation, you know, there's like this hierarchy and the fighter guys think they're the coolest and everyone, you know, when you're, when you're a student naval aviator, to be fair, everyone wants to fly, you know, when, when I was going through, everyone wanted to fly either the Hornet or the Tomcat. And, you know, so that was the top choice. A6s were the next choice, EA6Bs and S3s were kind of side by side. So, um, right. but you know, and it's ridiculous. It's kind of silly, um, but that's you know. I, I think that's just kind of the the feeling coming out of flight training, where you just you know you always want to be um, doing the the coolest stuff. And and um, but the S three Viking, and I think actually Sunshine was on your podcast earlier. It was yes. That joke about how you know we always joke that the S three had tinted windows so that your friends can't see you flying it, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it's not really fair because I the S three was such a fun jet to fly, and uh, when I first got the orders, you know when they when they lifted the ban, um, and I got the orders, I was um, you know I, I don't know I have mixed feelings about it because I I was. I just assumed that if the or if the ban was lifted, I'd stay in transition to Hornets. But um, there were already a few women flying Hornets who had a, many more flight hours than I had, and they didn't have any female pilots in the S three pipeline. And right. so, and you know, I had had some challenges at the Hornet squadron, and I, you know, I don't think they wanted me to come back. <laughs> So um, I got the um, orders to fly the S three B Viking and. I, you know, when I showed up there, I, um, it, the commanding officer of the squadron always welcomes the, the new pilots. And, um, when I talked with him, he, you know, I started saying, you know, sir, I don't, I don't know if you heard anything about my, some of the challenges I had at the Hornet squadron, but, and I didn't even get to finish the sentence. And he's like, look, Lieutenant Drowdy, all I care about is how you do here. And, you know, we're going to make sure that, uh, we make sure that all of our pilots are successful and we're going to make sure that you're successful too. So whatever happened in the past is the past. I don't care about it. You're in my squadron now. And you know, you're one of my students. We're going to make sure that you figure this out. And I'm like, cool. So, cause all I really wanted was just a fair chance. And, um, and I got that at the S3 squadron. So. Absolutely. Yeah. What was the initial role of the S3 and what was the role when you joined uh, the, uh, the, the platform? It was originally designed for anti-submarine warfare, and it, uh, you know, as the Cold War ended, and then um, the the nuclear submarine threats were really being managed more by our own submarine fleet, as well as uh, land-based platforms like the P3 Orion. Um, yeah. Over time, that mission transitioned for the S3s to more of a, a sea control mission. But for my first deployment, we did carry torpedoes. We did do anti-submarine warfare. I flew with a full crew, which meant um, a COTAC, so an NFO, Naval Flight Officer, sitting to my right. Mm -hmm. um, and then a TACO, a tactical coordinator, who's a Naval Flight Officer. And then a SENSO, which is a sensor operator who is an enlisted air crewman. Those two would sit in the back and they would listen, you know, if we had dropped sauna buoys, they'd listen to the sauna buoys, they'd be working the radar to see if we can spot periscopes. So we did do anti-submarine warfare missions on my first deployment, which was in 1995. But on my second deployment, we didn't do any ASW. By that point, it had, there really wasn't a lot of ASW to do. <laughs> there, right. You know, there, we we um, really were focused more on doing um, organic refueling for all the other jets in the air wing. And we also did sea control missions. So we'd go out and fly around, um, you know, we could go hundreds of miles away from the carrier and check out surface targets that might be difficult to pick up on radar. Um, we could identify those. We could go identify the flags and ports of call from, um, uh, from like big, tankers and um, supply ships and things like that. So really our mission transitioned over time, but originally it was anti-submarine warfare. Brilliant stuff. And 
what was the aircraft like to like start training on like ground training and flying training was it like uh, like again like a, a jump a, a completely different like, mindset from the hornet and how did you feel about that it it was in the sense of um you know now now i have a crew i have to coordinate with so yes. like i you know i'm not doing all the talking on the radio anymore and i'm i'm working with my navigator to figure out where we're going and so that I actually really liked, you know, I like being part of a team. So uh, that that was different. And we had simulators. So again, you know, start off in the classroom and then we moved to the simulators and then we moved to the aircraft. And it was um, uh, like carrier qualifications in the S3. Th that's the first time when you actually get to your um, jet that you're flying in the fleet. That's the first time you do night carrier landings and All night right. carrier okay. So you don't do that when you're a student naval aviator. Right. Um, so uh, I remember the first time I went out to land on the carrier at night, and you know the S3 um, Fleet Replacement Squadron, FRS Squadron. It used to be called the RAG um, uh, Replacement Air Group, something like that. Anyway, um, it was a you know it, it's located in San Diego. It was located in San Diego, and. So we got really lucky on my night qual carrier qualifications. We went out and I had an instructor NFO with me in the cockpit because um, the S3B is um, flown with a pilot and an, an NFO um, minimum, minimum two people. Sometimes we had four, but we flew out to, um, I don't remember which carrier we did our qualifications on, but it was like what we call a commander's moon. You know, it, the moon was bright. There was a nice horizon. You know, it was just like a, a slightly darker version than daytime landings. <laughs> so <Nice. laughs> and I joked with my instructor. I'm like, I, this isn't that hard. Like, I don't know what y'all are talking about. This isn't that bad. And then, oh, my God, once I got to the fleet and uh -oh. started <laughs> having to land at night where there's no horizon and horrible weather and, you know, the flight deck is moving around because the ship's going through seas. It's like, oh, OK, I bite my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Eat those words. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, what was it like working with a, like a, a four man crew or, you know, like did you talk to each other or did everyone know their job? So you just got with it or was it like you know john what what's happening back here you know that kind of thing it's definitely both so we always brief before our flights and as the pilot i'm normally the one running the brief and mm -hmm. we're talking about expectations for the flight so how what am i going to say if something happens what can you so everyone in the crew knows what to expect to hear from me if something happens you know for the major emergencies mm -hmm. and um, so we brief those and then we brief what we're going to be doing on the mission. We make sure everyone is clear about what their roles are on, on the mission. And then when we go out and fly, it's, you know, we're all up on the um, intercom within the jet talking with each other. And it's, you know, so there is continual communication happening as we're flying. Um, it is, yeah, I, you know, typically, especially with a four person crew, it's unusual for there to be silence because <laughs> everyone's you know talking with each other trying to figure out what's going on um especially if you're like prosecuting a submarine um or if we're trying to identify a surface target we have to have that communication happening so um so it was a, a i would say a mixture of both pre-planned and set expectations for who was going to do what and and who's going to say what mm -hmm. as well as real-time communications so can you talk us through a typical day on the carrier as an S, uh, S, S3 uh, crew? Like, what was that like, you know, waking up and to going to bed? Was it like, uh, was it nonstop? You know, it, it kind of depended on the day, but I would say a typical day when we're on deployment is um, aviators are, are lucky in the sense that um, since we fly fairly late into the evening, sometimes, you know, I wouldn't get up until like maybe eight in the morning. I'd go grab breakfast in the wardroom, which is where officers eat. And then um, I'd go to the ready room and the ready room was like the central place for the squadron where we brief our flights and um, where we hang out, you know, it's kind of the social center as well for the aviators of a squadron. And then, you know, I always had a ground job. So I, you know, one, I think during my first deployment, I had all of the, um, 
ordnance men in the squadron. That was my division. So I'd go down and check the a- AO is the rating. So I'd go down checking with the AO, see how things were going, if they needed anything. Um, and then, you know, back up to the ready room, hang out um, until it was time to brief for a flight. So typically on deployment, we'd fly once, maybe twice during the day. Um, and then, you know, in between flights, you grab something to eat, um, do your ground job, check in on your troops again, and then head back out and fly in the evening. And then when you got back, um, almost always, you know, people would stay up late for mid rats or midnight rations because typically that meant pizza, which was good. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, Or the Kitty Hawk made the best grilled cheeses I've ever had in my life. So, you know, stay up late for that and then go to, go to sleep after that. But um, I was also a landing signals officer. So on the days when I was doing that duty, I did not fly. And those were actually the longest days because I was up on the flight deck from the first recovery. So the first time um, airplanes are coming into land to the very last recovery. And that could be, you know, a 14 hour day, 16 hour day. And then with, even after the last plane recovered, we still had to go down to the, uh, to the, um, the space where the computers were, where we kept all the grades and have to enter oh, wow. all the grades in. And so it was, they were really long days, but they were very fulfilling. Like I really enjoyed my duties as a LSO. It was, um, that was a, a really fun team to be a part of. Yeah, let's talk about your time as an LSO. Like, so obviously, landing si- signal officer, is that correct? Yes. For our viewers out there. So would you be out there with like the Hornet guys, the Tomcat guys, or was it like type uh, specific? Yeah, so every squadron had um, a couple of LSOs, and typically I think three, and that way we could rotate, and every squadron would always have an LSO up there if your airplane was landing, and then typically even if you didn't have um, an airplane from your squadron landing, you'd be up there anyway just to help support the team. So, right. um, so there were every you know every squadron's LSO one LSO from every squadron would be up on the LSO platform as part of the recovery. And, um, you know, when you start off as an LSO, you typically are what we call waving. You are, and the reason we call that waving is, is because way back in the day, um, LSOs would literally stand on the back end of the aircraft carrier, um, holding these paddles that look like ping pong paddles. (laughs) Um, and they would, so that the pilots coming into land could see the signals from um, that pilot and they would react to whatever the LSO was telling them to do because um, LSOs and when you're looking at an an aircraft coming into land at the carrier, you can see the energy state on the aircraft um, like a split second faster, um, sometimes a little more faster than that, than the pilot can see it because, you know, the pilot's dealing with a lot of stuff altogether in the cockpit. And so LSOs are there for safety. Um, And so we call it waving because we used to wave paddles around um, to signal the pilot. So on the days that um, we're waving, when you start out as an LSO, you start waving your own aircraft type. So jets from your own squadron. And then you start learning how to wave other jet aircraft as well. And a lot of it is just, it's on the job training. You're, you're standing there, you know, watching landings after landings, and, and you're um, hearing the grades that the LSOs are giving to those landings and you're, and you're starting to understand the connections. So there is an LSO school that um, I went to, but it wasn't after, it wasn't until after I had been waving on my first deployment um, that I got to go do that more specialized training kind of like graduate school for lso's <laughs> absolutely and um so like on a carrier deck uh, would you like you guys and the the viking community like would you mix socially with the you know the tomcat guys the hornet guys the year seven guys how would that mix like you know when you go to the canteen or whatever or would that even happen oh definitely no um we definitely mix so um you know, the air wing, so the air wing is composed of all of the squadrons. So, you know, we had the S3 squadron, we had a couple of Hornet squadrons. On my first deployment, we had um, uh, an A6 squadron, then the Tomcat squadron. So all the squadrons are part of the air wing. And um, we, you know, before we deploy, we do training exercises together. So uh, we, we're getting to know each other professionally on the aircraft carrier, but then we, when we pull into port um, during Liberty, it's just 
we typically run into each other in town and there is definitely, um, you know, socializing that's happening. Um, lots of good nature rivalry, <laughs> drinking, games, things like that. So, and also, um, when I was on deployment and we'd pull into Jebel Ali in the Persian Gulf, we'd go into Dubai. And back then, um, nice. it, it, Dubai wasn't like how it is now. There Flat really were. Only, <laughs> oh my gosh! It was. It was. There were only a, a couple of hotels that were nice, where we, you know, we'd we'd all pitch in and get a nice suite um, where we can have have as our central, you know, Liberty headquarters. And um, so a lot of times pretty much all the squadrons were in the same hotel. So um, there definitely was socializing. And, and then we always, the air wing has a thing called Foxal Follies, which is um, maybe about twice during a deployment, the whole squadron, uh, the whole air wing gets together in the foxhole of the aircraft carrier. So it's a little bit of an open space, not as big as like the hangar, de- hangar um, bay in the aircraft carrier, but it's enough where you can fit in um, all the, all the aviators. And we basically just do skits that make fun of each other. <laughs> and so <laughs> um, some, some people would sing, you know, songs and it, it was really fun. So, yeah. That sounds awesome. Uh, but uh, before we get up, like onto uh, the personal questions here, um, Laurie, what would you say the strengths and weaknesses are of the S3? Oh, gosh. Well, the strength is um, it can stay afloat forever, which is also kind of a little bit of a weakness when it, when it comes to landing the plane because it just does not want to come down. Um, so the strength was that you could, you know, the S3 could go out on station for a long time. Um, it, it didn't burn gas as quickly as, you know, like a fighter jet. Um, and it had, um, you know, the four person crew was great for doing anti-submarine warfare missions for surface um, uh, missions or surface or sea control. Um, you know, two people was pretty much, uh, that was enough, but so strengths. Oh, the other strength is that the S3 has in the back of the jet, there's actually a little bit, of, it's a tunnel. We called it the tunnel where a lot of the equipment for the radars and, um, uh, to access, um, you know, different equipment, you could actually stand back there. And so... Oh, one of the strengths is the S3 was a great cross country jet because you could throw bicycles back there, you could throw skis back there, golf clubs. <laughs> I mean, so that was really nice. <laughs> Very um, nice. Yeah, it didn't really come into play on the aircraft carrier, but um, for cross country flights, that was great. Uh, and then the weakness, you know, it was subsonic. It um, wasn't the the sexiest looking jet. <laughs> But, you know, who cares? It could be, um, it, uh, it could be the C2, so that could be worse. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> no, I mean, the S3, honestly, it was such a great jet to fly. It was really versatile. It was forgiving. It was, um, you know, and it still was very nimble. Um, we did aerobatics. We, you know, we did, um, actually, this gets me back to the... DSET. Um, yes. <laughs> so when I first... Um, read that i in in um our s3 training we did a flight called um was it uh i think it was like defensive combat maneuvering or dcm that's it defensive combat maneuvering because basically if we're up and someone's going to come shoot at us the only defense we really have is to try to get as slow as possible (laughs) so and, and then get the hell out of there right so um so we didn't do aerial combat maneuvering. We did defensive combat maneuvering. So we learned how to, you know, pop out chaff flares and run. <laughs> so that was basically what we did. <laughs> but um, in between my my first deployment and my second deployment, we did uh, the Rim of the Pacific exercises, Rim Pack. And so on one of our missions, we took off and we had simulated um, Zuni rockets that we would carry um, in case we encountered any surface contacts. But um, a P-3 was uh, posing as a Russian um, electronic surveillance aircraft. And by luck, because we don't have an air-to-air radar, we found the P-3. And and so I um, <laughs> I rolled in behind the P three and and they were on the same radio frequency you know to coordinate the exercises and we told them we said something like Fox two um, meaning that we were 
shooting missiles at them. And and the, <laughs> they came up on the radio and they're like, say again, <laughs> like, what is this S3 doing? <laughs> and um, we're like, hey, we, we have Zuni rockets, so we're shooting you down. And they're like, oh, okay, you know, because they're just going to go back to Hawaii and, you know, go to the officers club and have a beer. Like, okay, yeah, we'll go home, no problem. But everyone was so excited. We're like, we got the first S3 air to air kill. So someone That's painted awesome. a P3 on the side of our jet and <laughs> That's awesome. That's Yeah, the, the S3 was not uh, an air-to-air combat platform. <laughs> but it's still a beauty, I have to say that. It's still a beauty, guys. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, how many hours did you get on the bike in uh, Laurie? Oh gosh. Um I think about 1400. Uh nice. 1300 14. I have about 1600 flight hours altogether from the Navy. Um so I think about 13 1400 of that was in the S3. Tell us what happened after your Navy career. Yeah, so after the Navy, um, you know, I was debating most of the, I, so after I deployed, I went to, um, I went back to the S3 um, FRS, Fleet Replacement Squadron, as an instructor. And that was really fun because I got to um, teach aviators how to land the S3B on an aircraft carrier. So that meant I got nice. to go out and do a bunch of daytime carrier landings. Um, but when that was finished, you know, I'd been in for 10 years. And so it was a tough decision because I I really enjoyed my naval service, but I also kind of felt like I'd been in the military for my entire life, having grown up in the in the military as well. And I also wanted to have kids. And I, you know, at that point I I had a hard time. Um, I thought it would be really tough to have to deploy. And I have so much respect for the parents that do that. Um, so I, all the other instructor pilots were going to the airlines, but that, even though I love flying that like they all, they always talked about how to fly the least, like how, do, how do you work the schedule so that you work the least? And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that either. Yeah. Um, so I ended up going to business school and because I had always really enjoyed my division officer jobs and, um, you know, leading divisions and. I thought, well, maybe this this might be something that's more in line with my strengths of things that I, I like doing. So after business school, I um, went to Silicon Valley and worked in tech for about 20 years. Oh, nice. um, started off as a management consultant and then moved into mostly marketing and operations jobs within uh, with startups and then a couple of, of tech companies, including Google. And my last job was at Meta. And now I'm an executive coach and a public speaker. And so I support leaders and help them with being resilient and dealing with change. So uh, lots to do these days for sure. So as I mentioned there, yeah, you're like, everyone's mentioned to me in the comments, you're Edinburgh Shaw. So tell me where this came <laughs> from, Laurie. Yeah, I, you know, I love writing. So that's, um, I actually, I wrote a book um, about my first deployment and that was published in 2000 by the Naval Institute Press. It's called, She's Just Another Navy Pilot. And I wanted to, to share what it's like to live on an aircraft carrier. And then, you know, it was also the first West Coast deployment with women in combat aviation squadron. So that was a unique perspective that I was lucky to be a part of. So I really enjoyed that writing process. And over the years, I kept doing some writing just on the side. And I had been attending some writing workshops. And the stories that I wrote that had anything to do with the Navy were always the ones where um, the other people in the group would be like, oh, tell us more about that. Like, because most people don't get to live on an aircraft well, carrier or, or yeah. fly jets in the Navy. And so, um, so I pulled a bunch of these stories together and the woman who runs the workshops, um, Beth Dunnington had, uh, helped another writer pull her stories together to make a one woman show. And I thought this actually could be an interesting one woman show. Um, I had done theater in high school and in college, and I'd even done some community theater in flight school. And so I was comfortable with being up on a stage, but, um, you know, I'd never written an entire play. So, uh, so I worked with her and, um, created this one woman show that talks about, um, how women were integrated into naval aviation, into, um, combat squadrons in the 90s and what um, our experience was like on the Lincoln, you know, from my point of view. Um, and then really, you know, where we are today and how far we've come and how far we haven't come over the 30 years that women have been flying in combat squadrons in the military. So uh, I did 
do the performance in Edinburgh last year, uh, 23 times. <laughs> so it was, uh, it, <laughs> oh my gosh. It was really fun though. I, I loved meeting the audiences after and you know they were incredibly supportive. And then I just finished um, a solo festival here in New York City. So, awesome. so I don't know what's next for the show at this point. You know, I think I'm just going to um, focus on my coaching and speaking work for a little while. But it was really, you know, an honor to be able to represent that period of time and the other women that I served with and the other men as well. And so I hope maybe, you know, I'll do it again in the future. So watch this space, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But also, you've got a new book out called uh, Saw Into Joy. Where did this come from, Laurie? That came from um, lessons that I've learned um, from the Navy, from working in Silicon Valley for 20 years, and also uh, from a lot of the work that I do now with executives and leaders and, um, you know, around coaching them as leaders as well as life coaching. And my first book was really more, this is what it's like to live on an aircraft carrier or to fly in the Navy. The second book is more around, this is what I've learned and this is what's helped me live what I find is a very fulfilling life. Like I feel really, um, you know, I'm not happy 100% of the time, but I do feel like I'm doing things that I care about and that I'm honoring my values and the life that I'm leading. So, um, so I wanted to share that in hopes that it will inspire somebody else, you know, who might need a little bit of inspiration. I've always found that uh, for me, I love reading. And so um, I have a huge library of books, many of which have helped me and I've, I have found inspiration from. So uh, I'm hoping to just, you know, pay that forward. Brilliant stuff. So before we get into uh, a couple of more personal questions, and uh, we got a, a few questions from uh, uh, one of our Patreons, uh, where can we find the books and yourself online? Yes, um, the books are on Amazon.com. So if you search under my name, the book should pop up. And I also have a website, lauriedrowdy.com. And that's, you know, my all in one website for speaking for the books for the show as well. There are links uh, to the play also. So it's probably the easiest place online. And then on social media on Instagram, my uh, Instagram profile is Lori Drowdy, all one word. And I'm also on LinkedIn. And that's pretty much I don't really do Twitter or X anymore. Um, and threads, I, you know, I have a profile in there, but I really don't use it. So mostly if you want to find me, I'm on Instagram. I do have a Facebook page as well for my business and my website. Brilliant stuff. And they'll be linked in the descriptions uh, below, guys. So, But we've got a question from one of our patrons, uh, Joe Kunzler. We've got a couple of here, yeah. Laurie. Uh, awesome. Did you ever get to use real or training weapons on the Viking? Um, we never had to, you know, quote, drop a bomb in anger. So actually, um, release any weapons with the intent of destroying something. Um, we did fly, we did train for that. Um, we, when, when I was on deployment, we always carried two Mark 82 bombs in case we had to do any kind of surface target prosecution. Um, my first deployment, we carried torpedoes. Um, so we did carry them, we did train for them, but thankfully I never had to um, actually use them. Great stuff. Good LSO story from Joe Kunzler again. Oh gosh. Um, I think when, <laughs> when I first started waving, when I first you know was doing LSO training, um, one of the pilots in the F-14 squadron um, Paco Chirichi. <laughs> he, oh, yeah. I interviewed him. Yeah. you probably know the story from my book, but, um, he, he was like a big brother to me and he, um, you know, I came up to the platform one day and we, you know, it was, I don't know if it's digital now, but back then it was all paper. You know, you write in a book with a pencil, with a pencil, because a lot of times things would be adjusted a little bit. Um, and I, you know, came up to the LSO platform and I had this pencil that, you know, I'm a creative person. It was very colorful. It had, I don't know, you know, pink, reds, yellows, who knows. But um, Paco saw that and he just grabbed it out of my hand and snapped it in half right in front of me and like threw it overboard. And I was like, what? And he's like, you know, we use standard issue pencils here, not these, you know, ridiculous girly pencils. I'm like, 
fine. So the next troll day, on the top. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> With the fuzzy hair. Yeah. God, oh, I wish I'd had one of those. Um, of course, the next day I, I went back up with another one, <laughs> another fully <laughs> pencil, and you know he laughed and then grabbed it and broke it in half and threw it overboard. And we both laughed about it. I was like, okay, so he knows that you know I I. I can take it. And um, I know that he means business, that we're going to stick to the standards of uh, standard issue military pencils. But I just, I really always appreciated that um, camaraderie and that joking around. And um, yeah, so that was one of the reasons why I really enjoyed being an LSO. That's brilliant. And last one from Joe, Viking or Hornet and why? man <laughs> not my question uh, yours <laughs> god um well i mean i guess the it, it's tough to just give a blanket answer to that because there were some things about the hornet that were awesome i mean it's just an incredible platform to fly um it just you know such a fun jet um i found the community to be a little bit more challenging to um be accepted into whereas the s3 community was very welcoming and um supportive and it was a great jet to fly so i'm gonna have to say s3 there you go and one from me which aircraft would you like to fly either past or present oh gosh um probably the f-14 tomcat i never got to fly in a tomcat never you know um it, it was it's kind of tough to get a ride in a tomcat because you know it's a oh, two really yeah and so um but yeah that's one of the only jets well that and an a6 it would have been really cool to fly in the a6 as well um but uh that was you know when i when the ban was lifted a6s were already they knew that their their days were numbered yeah. <laughs> so um so they did, i don't know if they i think maybe one woman had transitioned over to fly a6s but um I, that would have been a really cool jet to fly as well, but I didn't get to. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And before we wrap up, I'll just get a quick question. Did you ever get to fly with the REF or any other like European nations? No, no. You know, when we did RIMPAC, we did, um, I think we flew with the Japanese and maybe like the Australian Navy, but we, uh, I don't think we ever got to fly with any of the European um, right. Air Forces or Navy. So, no. Oh, well, there you go. But you, it sounds like you've had an absolutely amazing career, Laurie, and uh, everything will be linked in the description. But Laurie, thanks very much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're welcome. I had a great time too. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. <laughs>